This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Scherer. Typee by Herman Melville. Chapter 4 Our ship had not been many days in the harbor of Nukahiva before I came to the determination of leaving her. That my reasons for resolving to take this step were numerous and weighty may be inferred from the fact that I chose rather to risk my fortunes among the savages of the island than to endure another voyage on board the dolly. To use the concise, point-blank phrase of the sailors, I had made up my mind to run away. Now, as a meaning is generally attached to these two words, no way flattering to the individual to whom they are applied, it behoves me, for the sake of my own character, to offer some explanation of my conduct. When I entered on board the dolly, I signed, as a matter of course, the ship's articles, thereby voluntarily engaging and legally binding myself to serve in a certain capacity for the period of the voyage, and, special considerations apart, I was of course bound to fulfill the agreement. But in all contracts, if one party fail to perform his share of the compact, is not the other virtually absolved from his liability? Who is there who will not answer in the affirmative? Having settled the principle then, let me apply it to the particular case in question. In numberless instances, had not only the implied, but the specified conditions of the articles been violated on the part of the ship in which I served. The usage on board of her was tyrannical. The sick had been inhumanly neglected. The provisions had been doled out in scanty allowance, and her cruises were unreasonably protracted. The captain was the author of these abuses. It was in vain to think that he would either remedy them or alter his conduct which was arbitrary and violent in the extreme. His prompt reply to all complaints and remonstrances was the butt-end of a handspike, so convincingly administered as effectually to silence the aggrieved party. To whom could we apply for redress? We had left both law and equity on the other side of the cape, and unfortunately, with a very few exceptions, our crew was composed of a parcel of dastardly and mean-spirited wretches, divided among themselves, and only united in enduring without resistance the unmitigated tyranny of the captain. It would have been mere madness for any two or three of the number, unassisted by the rest, to attempt making a stand against his ill-usage. They would only have called down upon themselves the particular vengeance of this lord of the plank, and subjected their shipmates to additional hardships. But, after all, these things could have been endured a while, had we entertained the hope of being speedily delivered from them by the due completion of the term of our servitude. But what a dismal prospect awaited us in this quarter! The longevity of Cape Horn whaling voyages is proverbial, frequently extending over a period of four or five years. Some long-haired, bare-necked youths who, forced by the united influences of Captain Marriott and hard times, embark at Nantucket for a pleasure excursion to the Pacific, and whose anxious mothers provide them with bottled milk for the occasion, oftentimes return very respectable middle-aged gentlemen. The very preparations made for one of these expeditions are enough to frighten one. As the vessel carries out no cargo, her hold is filled with provisions for her own consumption. The owners, who officiate as caterers for the voyage, supply the larder with an abundance of dainties, delicate morsels of beef and pork, cut on scientific principles from every part of the animal, and of all conceivable shapes and sizes, are carefully packed in salt and stored away in barrels, affording a never-ending variety in their different degrees of toughness and in the peculiarities of their saline properties. Choice old water, too, decanted into stout six-barrel casks, and two pints of which are allowed every day to each soul on board, together with ample store of sea bread, previously reduced to a state of petrifaction, with a view to preserve it either from decay or consumption in the ordinary mode, 
are likewise provided for the nourishment and gastronomic enjoyment of the crew. But not to speak of the quality of these articles of sailors' fare, the abundance in which they are put on board a whaling vessel is almost incredible. Oftentimes when we had occasion to break out in the hold, and I beheld the successive tiers of casks and barrels, whose contents were all destined to be consumed in due course by the ship's company, my heart has sunk within me. Although as a general case, a ship unlucky in falling in with whales continues to cruise after them until she has barely sufficient provisions remaining to take her home, turning round then quietly and making the best of her way to her friends. Yet there are instances when even this natural obstacle to the further prosecution of the voyage is overcome by headstrong captains, who, bartering the fruits of their hard-earned toils for a new supply of provisions in some of the ports of Chile or Peru, begin the voyage afresh with unabated zeal and perseverance. It is in vain that the owners write urgent letters to him to sail for home, and for their sake to bring back the ship, since it appears he can put nothing in her. Not he. He has registered a vow. He will fill his vessel with good sperm oil, or, failing to do so, never again strike Yankee soundings. I heard of one whaler, which after many years' absence, was given up for lost. The last that had been heard of her was a shadowy report of her having touched at some of those unstable islands in the far Pacific, whose eccentric wanderings are carefully noted in each new edition of the South Sea charts. After a long interval, however, the Perseverance, for that was her name, was spoken somewhere in the vicinity of the ends of the earth, cruising along as leisurely as ever, her sails all bepatched and bequilted with rope yarns, her spars fished with old pipe staves, and her rigging knotted and spliced in every possible direction. Her crew was composed of some twenty venerable Greenwich pensioner-looking old salts, who just managed to hobble about deck. The ends of all the running ropes, with the exception of the signal halyards and poop down hall, were rove through snatch blocks, and led to the capstan or windlass, so that not a yard was braced or a sail set without the assistance of machinery. Her hull was encrusted with barnacles, which completely encased her. Three pet sharks followed in her wake, and every day came alongside to regale themselves from the contents of the cook's bucket, which were pitched over to them. A vast shoal of bonitas and albacores always kept her company. Such was the account I heard of this vessel, and the remembrance of it always haunted me. What eventually became of her I never learned. At any rate, she never reached home and I suppose she is still regularly tacking twice in the twenty-four hours somewhere off Buggery Island, or the Devil's Tail Peak. Having said thus much touching the usual length of these voyages, when I informed the reader that ours had as it were just commenced, we being only fifteen months out, and even at that time hailed as a late arrival, and boarded for news, he will readily perceive that there was little to encourage one in looking forward to the future, especially as I had always had a presentiment that we should make an unfortunate voyage, and our experience so far had justified the expectation. I may here state, and on my faith as an honest man, that though more than three years have elapsed since I left this same identical vessel, she still continues in the Pacific, and but a few days since I saw her reported in the papers as having touched at the Sandwich Islands, previous to going on the coast of Japan. But to return to my narrative. Placed in these circumstances then, with no prospect of matters mending if I remained aboard the dolly, I at once made up my mind to leave her. To be sure it was rather an inglorious thing to steal away privily from those at whose hands I had received wrongs and outrages that I could not resent. But how was such a course to be avoided, when it was the only alternative left me? Having made up my mind, I proceeded to acquire all the information I could obtain relating to the island and its inhabitants, with a view of shaping my plans of escape accordingly. The result of these inquiries I will now state 
in order that the ensuing narrative may be the better understood. The Bay of Nukahiva, in which we were then lying, is an expanse of water not unlike in figure the space included within the limits of a horseshoe. It is perhaps nine miles in circumference. You approach it from the sea by a narrow entrance, flanked on either side by two small twin islets which soar conically to the height of some five hundred feet. From these the shore recedes on both hands and describes a deep semicircle. From the verge of the water the land rises uniformly on all sides, with green and sloping acclivities, until, from gently rolling hillsides and moderate elevations, it insensibly swells into lofty and majestic heights, whose blue outlines, ranged all around, close in the view. The beautiful aspect of the shore is heightened by deep and romantic glens, which come down to it at almost equal distances, all apparently radiating from a common centre, and the upper extremities of which are lost to the eye beneath the shadow of the mountains. Down each of these little valleys flows a clear stream, here and there assuming the form of a slender cascade, then stealing invisibly along until it bursts upon the sight again in larger and more noisy waterfalls, and at last demurely wanders along to the sea. The houses of the natives, constructed of the yellow bamboo, tastefully twisted together in a kind of wickerwork, and thatched with the long tapering leaves of the palmetto, are scattered irregularly along these valleys beneath the shady branches of the coconut trees. Nothing can exceed the imposing scenery of this bay. Viewed from our ship as she lay at anchor in the middle of the harbor, it presented the appearance of a vast natural amphitheater in decay, and overgrown with vines, the deep glens that furrowed its sides appearing like enormous fissures caused by the ravages of time. Very often when lost in admiration at its beauty, I have experienced a pang of regret that a scene so enchanting should be hidden from the world in these remote seas, and seldom meet the eyes of devoted lovers of nature. Besides this bay, the shores of the island are indented by several other extensive inlets, into which descend broad and verdant valleys. These are inhabited by as many distinct tribes of savages, who, although speaking kindred dialects of a common language, and having the same religion and laws, have from time immemorial waged hereditary warfare against each other. The intervening mountains, generally two or three thousand feet above the level of the sea, geographically define the territories of each of these hostile tribes, who never cross them, save on some expedition of war or plunder. Immediately adjacent to Nukahiva, and only separated from it by the mountains seen from the harbor, lies the lovely valley of Hapar, whose inmates cherish the most friendly relations with the inhabitants of Nukahiva. On the other side of Hapar, and closely adjoining it, is the magnificent valley of the dreaded Taipees, the unappeasable enemies of both these tribes. These celebrated warriors appear to inspire the other islanders with unspeakable terrors. Their very name is a frightful one, for the word Taipee in the Marquesan dialect signifies a lover of human flesh. It is rather singular that the title should have been bestowed upon them exclusively, inasmuch as the natives of all this group are irreclaimable cannibals. The name may perhaps have been given to denote the peculiar ferocity of this clan, and to convey a special stigma along with it. These same Taipees enjoy a prodigious notoriety all over the islands. The natives of Nukahiva would frequently recount in pantomime to our ship's company their terrible feats, and would show the marks of wounds they had received in desperate encounters with them. When ashore, they would try to frighten us by pointing to one of their own number and calling him a Taipee, manifesting no little surprise that we did not take to our heels at so terrible an announcement. It was quite amusing, too, to see with what earnestness they disclaimed all cannibal propensities on their own part, while they denounced their enemies, the Taipees, as inveterate gormandizers of human flesh. 
but this is a peculiarity to which I shall hereafter have occasion to allude. Although I was convinced that the inhabitants of our bay were as errant cannibals as any of the other tribes on the island, still I could not but feel a particular and most unqualified repugnance to the aforesaid Taipees. Even before visiting the Marquesas, I had heard from men who had touched at the group on former voyages some revolting stories in connection with these savages, and fresh in my remembrance was the adventure of the master of the Catherine, who only a few months previous, imprudently venturing into this bay in an armed boat for the purpose of barter, was seized by the natives, carried back a little distance into their valley, and was only saved from a cruel death by the intervention of a young girl, who facilitated his escape by night along the beach to Nukahiva. I had heard, too, of an English vessel that many years ago, after a weary cruise, sought to enter the bay of Nukahiva, and arriving within two or three miles of the land, was met by a large canoe filled with natives, who offered to lead the way to the place of their destination. The captain, unacquainted with the localities of the island, joyfully acceded to the proposition. The canoe paddled on, and the ship followed. She was soon conducted to a beautiful inlet, and dropped her anchor in its waters beneath the shadows of the lofty shore. That same night, the perfidious Taipees, who had thus inveigled her into their fatal bay, flocked aboard the doomed vessel by hundreds, and at a given signal, murdered every soul on board. I shall never forget the observation of one of our crew as we were passing slowly by the entrance of this bay in our way to Nukahiva. As we stood gazing over the side at the verdant headlands, Ned, pointing with his hand in the direction of the treacherous valley, exclaimed, There! There's Taipee! Oh, the bloody cannibals! What a meal they'd make of us if we were to take it into our heads to land! But they say they don't like sailors' flesh, it's too salt! I say, matey, how should you like to be shoved ashore there, eh? I little thought, as I shuddered at the question, that in the space of a few weeks I should actually be a captive in that selfsame valley. The French, although they had gone through the ceremony of hoisting their colors for a few hours at all the principal places of the group, had not as yet visited the Bay of Taipee, anticipating a fierce resistance on the part of the savages there, which, for the present at least, they wished to avoid. Perhaps they were not a little influenced in the adoption of this unusual policy from a recollection of the warlike reception given by the Taipees to the forces of Captain Porter about the year 1814, when that brave and accomplished officer endeavored to subjugate the clan merely to gratify the mortal hatred of his allies, the Nukahivas and Hapars. On that occasion, I have been told that a considerable detachment of sailors and marines from the frigate Essex, accompanied by at least 2,000 warriors of Hapar and Nukahiva, landed in boats and canoes at the head of the bay, and after penetrating a little distance into the valley, met with the stoutest resistance from its inmates. Valiantly, although with much loss, the Taipees disputed every inch of ground, and after some hard fighting, obliged their assailants to retreat and abandon their design of conquest. The invaders, on their march back to the sea, consoled themselves for their repulse by setting fire to every house and temple in their route, and a long line of smoking ruins defaced the once smiling bosom of the valley, and proclaimed to its pagan inhabitants the spirit that reigned in the breasts of Christian soldiers. Who can wonder at the deadly hatred of the Taipees to all foreigners after such unprovoked atrocities? Thus it is that they whom we denominate savages are made to deserve the title. When the inhabitants of some sequestered island first descry the big canoe of the European rolling through the blue waters towards their shores, they rush down to the beach in crowds, and with open arms stand ready to embrace the strangers. Fatal embrace. They fold to their bosoms the vipers, whose sting is destined to poison all their joys, and the instinctive feeling of love within their breasts is soon converted into the bitterest hate. 
The enormities perpetrated in the South Seas upon some of the inoffensive islanders well nigh pass belief. These things are seldom proclaimed at home. They happen at the very ends of the earth. They are done in a corner, and there are none to reveal them. But there is, nevertheless, many a petty trader that has navigated the Pacific, whose course from island to island might be traced by a series of cold-blooded robberies, kidnappings, and murders, the iniquity of which might be considered almost sufficient to sink her guilty timbers to the bottom of the sea. Sometimes vague accounts of such things reach our firesides, and we coolly censure them as wrong, impolitic, needlessly severe, and dangerous to the crews of other vessels. How different is our tone when we read the highly wrought description of the massacre of the crew of the Habomic by the Fijis, how we sympathize for the unhappy victims, and with what horror do we regard the diabolical heathens, who, after all, have but avenged the unprovoked injuries which they have received. We breathe nothing but vengeance, and equip armed vessels to traverse thousands of miles of ocean in order to execute summary punishment upon the offenders. On arriving at their destination, they burn, slaughter, and destroy according to the tenor of written instructions, and sailing away from the scene of devastation, call upon all Christendom to applaud their courage and their justice. How often is the term savages incorrectly applied? None really deserving of it were ever yet discovered by voyagers or by travelers. They have discovered heathens and barbarians, whom, by horrible cruelties, they have exasperated into savages. It may be asserted without fear of contradiction that in all the cases of outrages committed by Polynesians, Europeans have at some time or other been the aggressors, and that the cruel and bloodthirsty disposition of some of the islanders is mainly to be ascribed to the influence of such examples. But to return... Owing to the mutual hostilities of the different tribes I have mentioned, the mountainous tracts which separate their respective territories remain altogether uninhabited, the natives invariably dwelling in the depths of the valleys, with a view of securing themselves from the predatory incursions of their enemies, who often lurk along their borders, ready to cut off any imprudent straggler, or make a descent upon the inmates of some sequestered habitation. I several times met with very aged men, who from this cause had never passed the confines of their native vale, some of them having never even ascended midway up the mountains in the whole course of their lives, and who accordingly had little idea of the appearance of any other part of the island, the whole of which is not perhaps more than sixty miles in circuit. The little space in which some of these clans pass away their days would seem almost incredible. The Glen of Tior will furnish a curious illustration of this. The inhabited part is not more than four miles in length, and varies in breadth from half a mile to less than a quarter. The rocky, vine-clad cliffs on one side tower almost perpendicularly from their base to the height of at least fifteen hundred feet, while across the vale, in striking contrast to the scenery opposite, grass-grown elevations rise one above another in blooming terraces. Hemmed in by these stupendous barriers, the valley would be altogether shut out from the rest of the world, were it not that it is accessible from the sea at one end, and by a narrow defile at the other. The impression produced upon my mind when I first visited this beautiful glen will never be obliterated. I had come from Nukahiva by water in the ship's boat, and when we entered the Bay of Tior, it was high noon. The heat had been intense, as we had been floating upon the long, smooth swell of the ocean, for there was but little wind. The sun's rays had expended all their fury upon us, and to add to our discomfort we had omitted to supply ourselves with water previous to starting. What with heat and thirst together, I became so impatient to get ashore that when at last we glided towards it, I stood up in the bow of the boat ready for a spring. As she shot two-thirds of her length high upon the beach, 
propelled by three or four strong strokes of the oars, I leaped among a parcel of juvenile savages who stood prepared to give us a kind reception, and with them at my heels, yelling like so many imps, I rushed forward across the open ground in the vicinity of the sea, and plunged, diver fashion, into the recesses of the first grove that offered. What a delightful sensation did I experience! I felt as if floating in some new element, while all sort of gurgling, trickling liquid sounds fell upon my ear. People may say what they will about the refreshing influences of a cold water bath, but commend me, when in a perspiration, to the shade baths of Tior, beneath the coconut trees, and amidst the cool, delightful atmosphere which surrounds them. How shall I describe the scenery that met my eye? as I looked out from this verdant recess. The narrow valley, with its steep and close adjoining sides draperied with vines, and arched overhead with a fretwork of interlacing boughs, nearly hidden from view by masses of leafy verdure, seemed from where I stood like an immense arbor disclosing its vista to the eye, whilst as I advanced it insensibly widened into the loveliest vale I ever beheld. It so happened that the very day I was in Tior, the French admiral, attended by all the boats of his squadron, came down in state from Nukahiva to take formal possession of the place. He remained in the valley about two hours, during which time he had a ceremonious interview with the king. The patriarch sovereign of Tior was a man very far advanced in years, but though age had bowed his form and rendered him almost decrepit, his gigantic frame retained all its original magnitude and grandeur of appearance. He advanced slowly and with evident pain, assisting his tottering steps with the heavy war-spear he held in his hand, and attended by a group of grey-bearded chiefs, on one of whom he occasionally leaned for support. The admiral came forward with head uncovered and extended hand, while the old king saluted him by a stately flourish of his weapon. The next moment they stood side by side, these two extremes of the social scale, the polished, splendid Frenchman and the poor, tattooed savage. They were both tall and noble-looking men, but in other respects, how strikingly contrasted. Du Titoir exhibited upon his person all the paraphernalia of his naval rank. He wore a richly decorated admiral's frock coat, a laced chapeau bras, and upon his breast were a variety of ribbons and orders, while the simple islander, with the exception of a slight cincture about his loins, appeared in all the nakedness of nature. At what an immeasurable distance, thought I, are these two beings removed from each other? In the one is shown the result of long centuries of progressive civilization and refinement, which have gradually converted the mere creature into the semblance of all that is elevated and grand, while the other, after the lapse of the same period, has not advanced one step in the career of improvement. Yet, after all, quoth I to myself, insensible as he is to a thousand wants, and removed from harassing cares, may not the savage be the happier man of the two? Such were the thoughts that arose in my mind as I gazed upon the novel spectacle before me. In truth, it was an impressive one, and little likely to be effaced. I can recall even now with vivid distinctness every feature of the scene. The umbrageous shades where the interview took place, the glorious tropical vegetation around, the picturesque grouping of the mingled throng of soldiery and natives, and even the golden-hued bunch of bananas that I held in my hand at the time, and of which I occasionally partook while making the aforesaid philosophical reflections, 